Okay, we're, we are recording now. Okay, good evening staff. Good evening fellow commissioners. The time is 613 PM on July 15th, 2021. And I would like to call this meeting of the growth management oversight commission to order. In the interest of public health and safety and pursuant to the governor's executive order in 29 20 members of the growth management oversight commission and staff are participating in this meeting by teleconference in order with the executive order. The public may view this meeting online, but not in conference room 103 building a 276 4th Avenue Chula Vista. The city launched a virtual commenting portal e comment that allows residents to comment and participate in the meeting from their own homes. You can find the link to e comment at www.chulavistaca.gov forward slash virtual meetings. Your comments must be received before I call for the close of the commenting period in order to be considered. After the commenting period is closed, I will announce a brief pause to allow the commissioners time to read any comments that have been received. If you have difficulty or need assistance with e-comment during a meeting, please contact Patricia Salvacion at p salvacion at chulavistaca.gov to assist you. Would the secretary please call the roll? Yes, um, Commissioner Alatore. I see that you're here. Can you hear us? Present. Present. Okay. Um, Chair Caudillo. Present. Commissioner Laniel. Buddy, he's having a uh, audio issues, but um, Connie's working with him on that. But he he's in attendance. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Strong. Here. Commissioner Torres. Here. And Chair Hooker is excused for today. Okay, so Chair Hooker is excused. Uh, Commissioner Laniel is having audio problems at the moment. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, yes that's correct. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to the consent calendar here. The first order of business is the consent calendar and approval of the June 17th, 2021 GMOC minutes. Do the commissioners have any comments? Yeah, this is Commissioner Torres. Before I move to approve, uh, I wanted to know, uh, it was uh, referenced in the commissioner comments that I had requested that staff attend a police advisory commission meeting to discuss the proposed metrics. I'd like to know uh, what's the status update on that. Was it done? We have not done that yet, Commissioner, and we um, have had some good conversations with um, police staff, but the we've been unable to get with the um, police chief to uh, talk to her, so we'd like to do that before we move on to showing you new metrics or going to the fire, the police oversight commission. Okay, but you are going to talk to the advisory commission as well. I will, I'm, I'm gonna have to get direction from management on that. As in Tiffany? Yes. Okay. Does that question get answered there, Commissioner Torres? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if if you're going to seek um, direction <laughs> from your supervisor, then uh, we're going to have to have a further discussion on this at the next meeting. Sure. If that meeting does not is not conducted, okay, uh, then I move to approve. Okay, is there a motion to approve the minutes? This is Commissioner Strong. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, Commissioner Strong. First, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Strong, seconded by Commissioner Torres. Secretary, please conduct 
the roll call vote, please. Okay. Commissioner Alatore, how do you vote? Commissioner uh, yes. Alatore? Yes. Commissioner Caudillo? Uh, yes. Um, one second. Commissioner Lingiel? Okay. Still having audio problems. Commissioner Strong? Aye. Commissioner Torres? Aye. And that's a uh, four to six. Or four to <laughs> what was the vote? I'm sorry. Okay, so okay. the June 17th, 2021 minutes passed with all commissioners present voting yes. Now we'll move on to the public comments portion. Public comments in this section on the agenda for members of the public to address the commission on items that are not listed on the agenda. I will now call for a two minute pause to allow the public to submit any public comments. As a reminder, please refresh the view on your screen to ensure new comments appear. Audio. Madam Secretary. Okay, the two minute timer is starting now. The timer has Patricia Salvacion, did anything come in? No comments have been received. Okay. So we'll move on to the presentation portion of the meeting. The first item on the our agenda tonight is 5.1 presentation by Southwest Strategies outreach consultant to the redistricting commission on Chula Vista redistricting efforts. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Melina Mesa. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, redistricting for the city of Chula Vista tonight. Um, I'm here to explain the importance of participating in the redistricting process. Um, and then I'll just wait till the <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna jump the gun there. <laughs> I'm waiting for the slides to come up. Um, so we can move on to the uh, third slide. Thank you. Um, so what is redistricting? Uh, with the passage of district elections by Chula Vista voters in 2012, uh, redistricting now occurs every decade following the release of census data to redraw boundaries for the four city council districts. The city of Chula Vista has appointed seven redistricting commissioners that will work with the public to gather feedback and present recommended maps to the city to the city council for final approval. During this process, it is important that our communities are present uh, and our and their voices are heard to ensure that they are better represented by future council members. Next slide, please. Why is redistricting important? Uh, redistricting increases representation to voters and allows greater access to government and increases accountability. Uh, districts are drawn to keep communities of interest together to increase their voice and impact on government decisions that will impact them and ensuring that communities of interest are properly represented will improve the effectiveness of city government. Next slide, please. And who should participate? Everyone, if you have a vested interest in Chula Vista, then you need to participate. Every resident, business, community organization all need to participate to have their voice heard and increase the effectiveness of the process. Next slide, please. And what does that process involve? The redistricting process is broken down into two phases. The first phase will include a series of four workshops, one held in each council district. During these workshops, the public will be able to present their concerns, maps of, and relevant information to the commissioners. During phase two, the public will have the opportunity to discuss the proposed maps, provide feedback, and the city will approve the final district maps in December of 2021. Next slide, please. And how to get involved. Uh, your help is needed to spread the word and increase involvement. We are asking you to leverage your networks to let everyone know about the redistricting process and increase participation, as well as you know, all, and encourage all of you to participate as well. Uh, there are four scheduled workshops. The goal is to have as many people attend these workshops as possible and participate in them. However, if you, if anyone's unable to participate, there are online interactive tools that can be used to provide feedback. And um, as I said, these are in four different in each council district. There's one in each council district, but that does not mean that you can only go to the one in your council district. You can go to any of them. The same presentation will be presented at all of them. We are just doing this for accessibility purposes. Next slide, please. And that, uh, if anyone is, like I said, if anyone is um, unable to attend one of the four workshops, they can still still participate by sending a letter, email, calling, or going online to use the interactive tools and maps. Uh, that would conclude my presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to ask, uh, maybe I missed it, but do you guys already have dates and times for the meetings? Or yes, workshops? yes, it... uh, the, in the how to get involved slide uh, right there on the, oh, there okay. on the right hand side. Okay. Yeah, and uh, we actually, you know, if anyone um, I at the last commission meeting where I was at, um, some of them, some one of the commissioners said that they want to present this information at their HOA. So I'm more than happy to send uh, the flyer with all of this information, with all the uh, workshop information, as well as how people can participate. And um, I know, understand that redistricting is something new for the city of Chula Vista. It, this is the first time that redistricting has been done. So I also have an FAQ sheet so that people can be uh, a little bit more informed if they're unaware of what, what redistricting is. Yeah, and I have a follow up question. So 
when you're talking about redistrict redistricting, are you talking about does that include like council seats as well? Uh, or <laughs> all involved in the redistricting. I mean, what what is the goal? So redistricting is something that just has to happen. Like I said, every every after each census, it's when it occurs, um, and it's basically it. There's many reasons why it's done. Um, you know, for, namely one of them that is done after population after the census is because the population might change. So the lines that define each council district might change. Uh, so, for example, some one of the lines might move like maybe two streets over, and somebody that was in one of the council districts might not no longer be in that council district anymore, and therefore they would be represented by a different council member. Having said that. Uh, a question did come up at another commission meeting where it was asked if, uh, if some say if somebody because this process because the census was, was so late this year, it, we are starting the process far later than we should. Be. Um, so if some say somebody's running for city council and they happen to fall in one council district, but after redistricting, they're no longer in that council district. Then they would have the opportunity to run for the council district that they're now in, or they would they can drop out of the race and then return the funds or donate them to charity. What well, uh, this is Commissioner Torres is that I don't know uh, if this young lady uh, Melina knows that uh, I'm the chair of the original districting commission. So this is the second time this has happened. And uh, we established the original council districts uh, that are now in effect. So I want to I want to understand what you just said is that uh, because under the law is that if a candidate um, because right now no uh, the filing period for city council and the mayor hasn't started yet okay so mm -hmm. uh, if somebody was planning to run say in district one okay. And because of redistricting, that counts that candidate, potential candidate, was cut out of that district and now is in district two. Then they would be required to run in district two if it was up for election during this election cycle. Is mm -hmm. that what you were saying? Uh, they are not required to run in that new council district, to my knowledge. Um, They're not required, other... but they can if yes, they so choose. Yeah, that is correct. They can, yes. And that is uh, what I initially said that they can, or yeah. the other option is they no longer want to run, and then they would have to. Okay, I just want to make sure that yeah. I understood you correctly. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. All right. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, uh, if no one else has any questions, uh, then that would conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for allowing me to present today. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Are we there? Two minutes. Go ahead. I was going to ask if you want to call for a two minute pause. Yes. Okay. Uh, the timer starts now.
Commissioners, no comments were received. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, moving forward, our next item on the agenda is 6.1 continuation on progress of the growth management program comprehensive review. Staff presentation by facilities financing manager Kimberly Elliott and associate planner Kim Vanderbee. The staff recommendation commission to hear the presentation and make comments or ask clarifying questions. Does staff have a presentation? Yes, we do. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Kim and I just want to again thank you for the great input you gave us at the last meeting. It was really valuable. We went back to um, our various department heads and fellow staff members and with your questions and comments and got some clarifications. What I'd like to do tonight, originally I wanted to just go straight to the second half of the metrics. As you recall, we, we got through about half of them. Tonight I want to go to the second half, but since uh, our fire chief, Chief Munz is here, I'd like to go over the fire, the public safety um, metrics. And as you recall, one of the great questions you had was why is the value of property damaged by fire um, a metric that the fire department uses? So Chief Munns, if you could explain that, um, you gave us a really good explanation and we made a decision to keep it in. So it'd be great if we could hear from the horse's mouth. Sure, um, just want to confirm everybody can hear me okay? Yes. So um, the value of property damage um, caused by fire is a, a unique indicator of, of how well your fire services are being provided um, as it relates to fire calls them specifically. And, and so a good example might be, and I'm gonna use um, some artificial numbers just to kind of paint the picture. And, and if um, I can prepare uh, information about you know, our actual numbers, I apologize, I don't have them with me. <clears throat> but if you, if you have 400 fires every year and your property value um, on, on one year is um, $10 million and then the next year is $20 million, you, you could look at just the, the call volume alone and say, well, we've, we had a roughly 400 fires each year. So, hey, everything's staying fairly static. Um, and, and maybe we don't have a, a fire problem. However, um, as I described, you know, fire severity is, is different in each instance and what type of occupancy and, and, and I'll go a step further. Um, a lot of times in the fire department, our goal is to keep the fire um, within the room of the, the originating, originating structure um, that it started. And, and that's our goal is to keep it to that room of, of origin, as we like we call it. Um, if if we don't get there in a timely fashion or we don't have the right resources showing up in a timely fashion to, to put out a fire, then what commonly happens is that fire moves from the room of origin to now the floor of origin or the, the whole structure of origin. And then if it gets um, if, it, if it's really not handled properly, then then it can go to the next structure over. And, and start to damage the exposures. So with that context, the idea here is um, keeping your eye on the property damage on an annual basis is important because when I look at our numbers um, and you look back over 10 years, our fires uh, count has, has varied from anywhere from 350 to 450 for the last 10 years, but yet we're a growing city, um, uh, our overall call volume is going up. Our our responses to fires are going up. We we you know start out in the you know in that same range of about ten years of maybe fifteen hundred calls for fires, um, and now we're up to over two thousand. So, just looking at the data does not describe what our true fire issues are and and uh, impact to the community. And so, by putting the value and keeping your eye on that that number, it definitely shows, you know, the performance of your fire services, 
Are you being effective? Is there a certain property type that we need to focus on? Um, are all of our fires going growing beyond the room of origin and therefore we need to get more resources to these fires quickly? Um, th there's just a lot of additional factors that help uh, the fire service make adjustments um, with that number. Uh, Chief, this is Commissioner Torres. Um, first, I, I want to commend staff for the memo they provided, you know, to the agenda packet. Because if, if the commissioners read the memo, all the information was there. But uh, I want to—I'm the one that brought up the issue of the, of the value of this metric. And let me tell you why: is that you could have, say, one high rise, okay, burn. And, and if you only look at the value of properties independent of any other variable, you could have 20 homes burn, okay? And they would be in, in the value of the property equivalent to that high rise. So the question I have for you, is there any way that we could get the information value of property damage broken down between residential, commercial, industrial? Because to me, that would make a lot more sense then and would give a lot better analysis for whoever looks at that information. Can that be done? Uh, absolutely. Yep. Then if I would suggest to staff is that we just make that little tweak to that and I think it would, that metric will be a lot more valuable. Thank you, Chief. Great, we'll make that change. And then the next thing you asked was, can the response times be generated by fire station? And they already are generated by fire station. And I believe that's how it comes in um, the questionnaire, but we can, Chief, do you wanna address that at all? Sure, and and I think um, yeah, Kim, Kim definitely uh, hit, hit on it just there a moment ago. So in the past questionnaires, we have provided um, response times by fire station district, but it was always provided in in the questionnaire as a as an add on. It it was never really part of the overall ordinance for the GMOC fire and EMS response criteria. So um, I, I don't know. I guess it, it at this point, I, I think it's a over the years. I think the fire department has made a, a concerted effort to try to maybe influence the commission to consider that because um, our, our, at least my recent um, goals in, in my current position and in my last position was that we didn't have a balanced approach to our service delivery. If you lived on one part of the city, you, you might, you, you definitely received a quicker and um, yeah, quicker service than other parts of the city. And, and to me, that's an issue. Like we need to be able to provide service equally across the city. And so when you look at like the current GMOC um, ordinance and, and the standard, it's an aggregate of the entire city. And and the, the reality is we have two fire stations that run more than 50% of the calls in the entire city. And they're both on the west side. And, and because of that volume, their performance numbers are are really good compared to some of our Eastern fire stations. So by looking at these responses by station, you definitely start to see where, um, you know, certain areas perform better than others. So it definitely adds to the, the context of how the service is being delivered. So commissioners, if it's okay with you, we'll just add um, to the end of this by station, if that's what you would like. Sounds good to me. Okay. Next slide, Connie. So one of the uh, conversations we had was um, you asked us about educational programming. Uh, are the police going out and educating our kids? What kind of workshops are we having for the public? So we got into a conversation with the chief about that and what came out of that was we really should have a category of fire prevention. So we added these four metrics, um, percentage of the annual California State Fire Marshal regulated occupancy inspections, 
the annual percentage of new business license expense exp inspections completed within 30 days, annual percentage of fire of fire origin and cause investigations performed by the fire prevention personnel. And that would be of the total that they do um, or that they need to do, what percentage did they get to? And then the number of public education and outreach sessions, classes, events that they have annually. Um, and I know we just got one in our uh, inbox for one, one that you're holding very soon. So, Chief, do you want to elaborate on any of those? Um, no, other than they, they all originated from the public safety staffing plan that was developed in 2017. And it talked about just the overall services you know, within the fire department and and ways that the fire department uh, measures itself. Um, so it, these are definitely supported in, in other areas within, um, yeah, within the city and the fire department. And I, I just, yeah, any questions, I'd be happy to, to try and answer them the best I can. Does any other commissioners have a question? Because I do, I, I don't want to dominate this meeting, but anybody? Go ahead, Commissioner Morris. Okay, I just want to ask um, the first bullet that you're talking about inspections for occupancy permits, right? Is that what you're talking about? The first bullet there is talking about state mandated inspections, and that ties into churches, um, apartments, uh, condos, uh, schools. That's where the state of California comes in and says, hey, all our fire services need to perform those inspections to code. Gotcha. So I was just wondering, are we missing the one word completed? Because because when you read it, it, it uh, percentage yeah. inspections completed. We can add that or something. You know what I mean? Because you have to compare yep. it to something. The other ones make sense, but that one kind of stuck out. Is like, well, what are we measuring? You know what I mean? Are we measuring the number and then the percentage, the numbers requested and the percentage of those completed? What are we measuring? The percentage of those completed against the number that were required. Exactly. Something like that. Does that make sense, Chief? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, I have a question. This is our commissioner for you. So I, I kind of um, missed the last meeting a little bit because I was having um, some connection issues. So I'm not sure what was all really discussed because I missed probably half the meeting. So I'm kind of getting in on the tail end of this. But so going this, my question kind of really maybe encompasses all three. Maybe it's been discussed, but Commissioner Torres brought up a good point that the fires and property damage could be skewed by the nature of what's burning, right? Um, so I guess my question would be, are we, are we tracking response times or is the response times that we track, is it categorizing like just response times to just fires or is that all um, combined together in the response time. The reason why I'm saying is because if we're really looking at tracking property damage, it would be also nice to correlate that to the, you know, in other words, if, if response times are going down for fires, then the loss of property should also go down. Is that correct? There definitely is a nexus for that. Correct. Okay, so do is will our data capture that if we ever would need it? Well, the, I guess the data that that's captured. I mean, we capture all of our response data, whether it's fire based or EMS based. So we we absolutely have all of those numbers, you know, and ob obviously to the specific call type itself. So, um, but there definitely is a, a nexus to uh, the shorter the response time. In in theory, the the smaller the fire. Um, right. Because you're getting to it sooner, right? right? And and therefore, on an EMS call, you know, if it's an acute type call, a cardiac event, the sooner you know we get there, the the probability of outcome increases dramatically. So, if I was to ask hypothetically, okay, what is the response time for an average fire call? Is that sole and separate though, or is that 
commingled into the total response time? Uh, Commissioner, if I could, Connie, go back one slide. So this is for fire responses. So that one, okay, for fire. Okay. This is their goal, seven minutes, 90% of the time. It used to be 85% of the time, and the chief wanted to raise it to 90% of the time. And then, Connie, go ahead, two slides. So, separately, they measured the emergency medical response. Right. So the EMS portion is measured separately? And, Correct. And then the, but, so we have a goal for fires, but is it measured though? Yes. It is, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Just wanted to clarify that. Sure. Okay, I'm, I'm finished, thank you. Okay, so we'll just stay on this slide. Um, so chiefs it's new to have that you guys are um you took ems in-house so maybe you can walk through these metrics sure so the top bullet is really focused on first responders so that's that's an engine you know truck usar what's traditionally you have seen in, in your fire stations throughout the city and so the unique part about that is, is we call them as a, a first responder is um, they get dispatched the same time as an ambulance, but the intent behind this is that there's there's more fire stations and, and fire engines and trucks than there are ambulances. And so the for all intents and purposes, the fire department arrives on scene first and, and, and the quickest. And so that metric is for that first responder to arrive on scene within seven minutes, 90% of the time. <clears throat> and really they're there to initiate patient care and stabilize the patient and prepare them for transport. Um, then, then you move to the second bullet and now we start to talk about what the ambulance requirements are. And so this is for an, an ALS ambulance or advanced life support ambulance to be on scene within 12 minutes, 90% of the time. And so their purpose is to then get the patient transferred to them from the first responder. And now they, they take possession of the patient care and then transport them to the hospital. And so the unique part about this that I really want to focus on is that really emer EMS or emergency medical services from a 911 perspective is really a two part system. You have the first responders and then you have the ambulances because with what I just described, as soon as the ambulance takes possession of the patient, now that first responder is available for the next call. And so that's the critical piece is that once an ambulance has a patient, they can't run another call. And so their typical um, average time on task with a, a medical patient is about um, 116 minutes per call. And then, and of course, that's that's the typical, um, like in an average type approach. And they, they absolutely have times where they have a patient for over three hours. And, and the reason for that is typically is um, once they get to the hospital, the hospitals are overloaded and they sit on the wall, as we call it, uh, wall time for upwards of, of two, three, four hours. Um, and they're committed to that incident. They can't respond to another call. And then a lot of times um, emergency departments, we have two here in the city, but um, a lot of times these patients are, are Kaiser patients. And, uh, or if it's a, um, a child, they get transported to children's hospital. So they're being, these ambulances are being pulled out of the city. And so if you relied on a system, an EMS system that was you know, solely on say ambulances, you, you would run into a significant issue of not having anybody to respond to calls when, when you do hit those peak volume times and all the ambulances are assigned or, or most of them are assigned uh, with patients. So that's the unique piece of a two part system um, to really have the redundancy and the ability to respond to the community. So the first responder gets their First and, and, and then typically the quickest, seven minutes, 90% of the time, they transfer the patient care over to the ambulances. The ambulances then transport the patient um, and, you know, for that full continuum of care and, and transport to the hospital. That last bullet is um, different from the second one. It's still related to ambulance transport, 
but these are for urgent calls. So they're calls that, that are, are not triaged as advanced life support. And so there's a different time frame for responses for the, the um, ambulance unit. And so they respond within 20 minutes, 90% of the time. So any questions on, on those? Chief, one of the questions that the commission raised last meeting was, are these national response times? Mm. I thought they were, and you corrected me. So maybe you oh, can got it. expand on that. Sure. <laughs> on the first responder side, the the national standards are six minutes, 90% of the time. So it's 60 seconds quicker. Um, as far as ambulance transport, it's really hard to say because now the national standards get really fuzzy. There's there's really not one specific national standard. However, um, I would say in the state of California, these two time frames, 12 minutes, 90% of the time, and 20 minutes, 90% of the time, is really the standard in the state. So, um, and the county as a whole, um, as far as county EMS goes, um, that that those are the, their standards as well. Great, thank you, Chief. If no one has any other questions for the Chief, uh, we'll move on and he can go do firework. <laughs> thank you, Commissioners. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to address the, the Commission. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, Connie, let's jump to slide 22. Okay, so this is where we left off um, at the last meeting. Economic development is uh, one of the topics. It's a new topic. We hadn't had this before, but we thought it was important. And so we came up with metrics that would measure how our city is doing economically. So we, or we want to look at the annual unemployment rate annual median household income, annual population growth rate, and the vacancy rates by land by use type. So retail, office, industrial, residential, that's always a good um, measure of how business is doing. And then the number of small business loans to minority groups and the annual number of tenant improvement permits issued. So, so, if I may, this is Commissioner Torres. Um, this, um, because remember, I'm the I'm the representative of the Planning Commission on the GMOC, and uh, last night we had our Planning Commission where I talked about this uh, briefly to the Commission. And first, I want I want to thank staff for putting together this draft. But as I noted to the Commission, and I did not uh, actually um, tell the Commission all of the um, the new metrics that I was going to present tonight, and I'm actually going to send a follow up email to Kimberly and, and Kim because um, I informed their their boss, Tiffany, that uh, I was going to make uh, uh, this announcement and submit my uh, add ons to to this and uh, I'll forward that email right after this meeting. But um, the problem with this uh, initial draft is doesn't address the primary concern of the planning commission, and that was employment jobs. And if you uh, recall in the in our approval of the minutes from our last meeting, there was specific reference with regard to the community to the planning commission presentation and our concern about employment and jobs. So. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to just rattle off the types of metrics that I think adequately um, address the Planning Commission's um, uh, perspective, if you will, and what is trying to uh, um, to achieve through this process. Um, and, and what I would encourage Kimberly and Kim actually is to take what I'm uh, offering, take it back to Mr. I believe his name is Crockett, the uh, ED director, um, yes. because 
the the concern that I had with regard to what's being presented is that there was no direct linkage or tie in to the CD's ED work plan. Okay. And so what I'm going to offer is this, and, and again, uh, Kimberly and Kim, I'm going to email this to you and, and I would encourage you to go back to uh, director uh, Crockett, have them look at it and then come back to us as to what uh, you as staff can agree upon that would uh, address the planning commission's concerns. So the metrics I have is are this, the number of city sponsored econom economic development projects, the number of new jobs created through city sponsored economic development efforts, the annual dollar amount of investment created through city sponsored economic development efforts, the total number of jobs by sector industrial, commercial, hospital, et cetera, the annual percentage increase in the business tax base, uh, the county assessed valuations of properties classified as industrial and commercial, and then new business re registrations, new business startups, the annual sales tax per capita, and last but not least, the existing and available acreage zoned as industrial and commercial space. These are the types of, of metrics that the planning commission that aligns with what the planning commission, um, um, I believe, would like to see. So again, um, and you and here here was another throw in I thought about actually, is that I don't know if the commissioners know there's a new city sponsored app called Choose Choose Chula Vista that uh, provides discounts to residents who. Uh, patronize Chula Vista businesses. Now, I don't know if this app is a flash in the pan, but it would be nice to know how well the city is, is doing relative to uh, residents and, and businesses utilizing that new city created app. So that's another throw in again, that goes to what the planning commission uh, would like to see. So if any of the commissioners have uh, any concerns or any questions about what I just articulated, I'd like to very much uh, hear them now. And if not, then like I said, I'll just simply forward this as an email to Kimberly and Kim and they can go back to Director Crockett. Anybody? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Torres. This is uh, Commissioner Cadillo. I do have um, a comment uh, slash question, I guess. Um, so something that, I would be interested in knowing about because, you know, Chula Vista to go work, right? I, I can't remember what the number is, but it's 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 large. So I think, you know, what our goal should be as a city would be to attract companies to come down here. Uh, right. Whether they're large companies, medium sized companies, or even incentives for smaller companies to to establish business here. So I would be, I would like to know first, and maybe this data is already being captured somewhere, and maybe they have it, or maybe it's there, but it's just not able to be retracted out. But I would like to know what the size of our businesses are. Like how many businesses do we have that have 25 or less employees? How many businesses do we have that are 100 or less? Or how many do we have that are 200 or more? That's a or great what, question. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. Huh? Great, that, great point. Great point. Yeah. So I'm not. So I mean, I'm. I'm not saying those need to be the numbers, but I'm just as an example, mm -hmm. because it would be help in our marketing of Chula Vista. It would just be nice to know what we have. And because we know where we want to go. So I think something along those lines, I think I would like to see put in the economic development metric. Yeah, just to let the commission know, I actually started with about 20 and then I had to whittle it down, you know, to what I thought were the real uh, primary ones. But yeah, uh, Commissioner Cardia, absolutely. And that was actually similar to one of the ones I was considering presenting. And so mm -hmm. I definitely I definitely am on your wavelength, but anyway, so that's why I stopped at uh, relatively eleven instead of the original twenty. So yeah. are there any other commissioners? Yeah, and I and, and uh, fellow commissioners, I think really this is, I mean, 
they're all all everything that we're doing is super important but the economic development is just as important as public safety um so you know and i know we're all working hard at this so we just you know we want to get it right so even if we have to take a little bit longer to get it right um right. that's the path that we should continue going on right what about the other commissioners, strong or um Daniel or Ala Torre, do you have any comments? This is Commissioner Lindholz, Strong. I have oh, my audio course. back. Um, I would just, yeah, just follow up and state. I agree if we could have, um, I think he's now Deputy City Manager Crockett look at it. I think he'll provide good insight. I agree. This is Commissioner Strong. I agree with you. I think uh, as much as we can be in alignment and have, have the feedback of the um, uh, of the uh, county of the uh, city staff, I think that'd be good. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot off this email with this uh, ma uh, matrix to Kimberly and Kim, and then have them go to uh, Crockett, and let's see what we come up with next time. Okay. Um, before you do that, Kim or Claudia, what's the appropriate way for him to submit that? Is it through Claudia? Um, he could he could send it to me, and then um, we can discuss internally how to distribute. Oh, okay, because we send, may send it to you, Claudia. Yes, that's fine. Okay, yeah, sounds that'd good. That'd be great. And then because we may want to send it to the other commissioners as well. Okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner Torres. I heard you loud and clear from the very beginning about the jobs housing balance, and I I believe we all feel strongly about that. And a number of those um, metrics that you mentioned, I discussed with um, Mr. Crockett, and he said that kind of data wasn't available. But I am happy to go back to him again and ask uh, those questions. With regard to the Choose Chula, I got that presentation a few weeks ago at our city manager's meeting, and I think it's awesome and have requested that Kim and I get that presentation so we could fold it into what we're doing here. So good, good call on that. Kim, does that conclude the presentation? Kim, we, we, we weren't able to hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you hear me? I no. said ne next no. slide, please. There you go. <clears throat> uh, okay, so Commissioner Torres, this uh, does address some of the um, ideas that you had. So for fiscal, um, we wanted to look at and we went over this with the former uh, director of finance. The annual state and federal grant money received per capita. And that was something that um, one of the council members had asked for. Annual sales tax generated per capita. Annual general fund dollars spent per capita. Annual percentage to target for reserve funds annual uh, pension unfunded liabilities, annual TOT tax generation, and annual auto park sales revenue. So I'll open to questions or comments. I know Commissioner Cadillo had a lot of concern about this, Topic. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I do. Um, I, so on the bullet point there, annual pension unfunded liabilities, is that in total or per retiree? Or can we break that down? Uh, I believe it's provided as a total. Okay, can we break it down maybe further? To, I'm not sure to answer your question. I well, can ask. We have a total amount of unfunded liabilities, and then how many how many uh, retirees does that represent? Okay, the number. I'll yeah. ask.
Okay. All right. There's I, just have a, I just have a question. Bullet number four. Annual percentage to target for reserve funds. I know what it's trying to say, mm -hmm. but uh, is there a better way to say it? Because yeah. you know what I mean? It's kind of confusing, yes. Uh, yeah, I know what it's trying to say. Right. <laughs> I, used to, I used to be a budget analyst, but uh, but it may be a better way to say that. Yeah, so I you hear know. you. Um, okay. I think that's a shorthand that they use in that yeah. department, uh, target to reserve. So, yes, I will try and get some better language on that. Okay, next slide. If you're all done with fiscal, I don't want to jump in. Okay, so sustainability. Um, previously, I believe um, the focus was primary air quality, but we added a number of subtopics. So we'd like to measure the annual percentage of days that the air quality is rated as unhealthy for sensitive populations. And that's data we get from the uh, APCE, Air Pollution Control District, annually. Uh, then energy, we like to look at the annual percentage of renewable electricity consumed, and that would be either from eg e or the new um, community provider. The number of solar permits issued each year uh, the annual percentage of homes that have solar. So hopefully you know, we can look at the total homes and see that number growing. And the annual number of energy storage permits issued. So um, there's permits issued for battery storage on site. Next slide. Wait, before we go. Okay. Uh, could you on energy, um, unless any other commissioners uh, uh, pose this, one uh, additional metric I'd like to see, because um, this comes up before the planning commission a lot of times, not only the solar permits, but um, electric charging, um, electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, and I know city staff does collect that information. <laughs> we. So, we do, and I believe we have it under transportation. We were debating about whether to put in energy or transportation. So whatever your pleasure, we can we can move it if you like. Yeah. It, oh, I I I forgot about that. But yeah, either way. But uh, the other thing is that I think we need a when we put this together is the definition of sensitive populations. Okay. Yeah. What is who? What does that mean? I right. imagine it's it's old. Uh, low income, you know, yada, yada, but uh, I think uh, that might help. And, th and this is Commissioner Strong. I, I would also, um, I think it might be worth us to see maybe in the future um, a presentation on the climate equity index and how that relates to some of this work um, to see how that might influence these indicators moving forward. Well, that's, a, I, that's I want, perfect. That's, that's a great a understanding on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe staff can can work on that. Is pro maybe pro come back with with some metrics relative to that. Um, that's a really good one. We had a long conversation with Corey on this. Unfortunately, some of the climate metrics aren't done very often. Um, mm -hmm only every few years, but I'll go back to him on that. And the other one you said was the number of EV charging stations. Do you want that um, to be the public ones? Uh, public and city. In public and you mean private, like residential or just the. Well, I mean, all, all uh, EV charging stations have to come to the city for a permit, so. Okay. I don't know how staff. Yeah, we might want to break it down. Yeah, I don't know how staff congregates that <clears throat> information. And just uh, just so you know, we're developing a policy. We've started to have organizations like Tesla come to us and wanted 
put their charging stations in the public um, parking um, spaces, oh, oh. and we're developing a policy around that. Yeah, because I'm seeing those charging stations popping up everywhere now. You know, right. grocery stores. You know. Yeah. Um, and there's CVS. Everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> And okay. there's pros and cons because they take away regular spaces if they're you know not being used. Right. But... Okay. Next slide. So still under oh that's where we put it um, under greenhouse gas the last bullet publicly accessible EV charging stations but we I'll find out if we can get the private numbers well. So under greenhouse gas, uh, annual per capita GHG inventory. That looks weird. I can't remember if that was a separate bullet. I believe it was, sorry, we're missing a bullet there. Annual total solid waste per capita, uh, waste diversion rate, uh, number of trees planted annually, and the number of days uh, that the city operates the cooling zones uh, for extreme heat. The <clears throat> environmental group felt like that was kind of a climate change indication that every year it seems like there's more and more hotter days and that the city is great about providing these cool spaces for, for folks to go into. <laughs> so this is probably where we'd look at the climate equity index. Anything else on sustainability? Okay, next slide. Health and wellness, um, a lot of this information we got from the county's uh, Live Well program. They can provide this data um, for us. So we have three categories, equity and access to health care. So percentage of population without health insurance, uh, or the number of ER beds per capita. And we saw that that was really critical during the COVID pandemic. Um, medical specialists per capita. And under health conditions, number of adults who use tobacco, percentage of children engaged in physical activity at least one hour a day, and the number of res residents who had difficulty finding affordable fresh fruits and vegetables in their neighborhood. And at our healthy aging, the average number of years a baby born today is expected to live. And the percentage of population sufficiently healthy to live independently. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Okay. So, I have a question. Um, what about, are we keeping track of um, I think this would be appropriate in this category. Are we keeping track of the retirement facilities, assisted living facilities, like the number of beds we have in the county, anything like that? Well, we we're focused citywide, so I don't know if that's something that's tracked. <laughs> mm -hmm. We could look into it. Yeah, could you? I have a couple ideas with that, but I, I think that would be, you were talking about health and wellness where, mm -hmm. you know, as people age, that's going to be a resource or a need. So right. I think that would be important to track that. See if we're losing beds or gaining beds. Yeah. Are we talking about group homes, assisted living, or what are we talking about? Well, I mean, it could be really a combination of the two. I mean, it could be, you know, um, special medical facilities that house people long term. It could be assisted living facilities. It could even be like convalescent homes, too, I guess. Gotcha. Yeah. 
I think, I mean, I think it would be nice to track that to see, you know, if we're losing these businesses, gaining them, you know, we're losing beds, gaining beds. Because okay. as the population ages, that's going to be more in need. Right. The baby boomers. So I think it'd be a, have some kind of data on that. Okay, we'll look into it. Okay. And just real quickly, I think again, a little definition of what medical specialist means. Okay. All right, Nick, anything else? Next slide. Under infrastructure, we have a number of items we met with um, our public works director and our engineering folks. So under road maintenance, um, we, remember we had Frank uh, Rivera pre present on the pavement condition index that they do, and we can calculate the linear miles that are repaired annually. Uh, the square feet of potholes that are patched annually, the number of traffic signs repaired and maintained annually, the pounds of weeds on public right-of-way trimmed and removed annually, and the pounds of trash or debris on public right-of-way collected and removed annually. So that's for road maintenance. Next slide. Sewer storm drain, uh, number of miles of sewer main, sewer mains cleaned annually, uh, the number, and we can combine some of these, I realize they're repetitive, number of miles of sewer inspected annually, because uh, you can imagine some are inspected and clean and some are just inspected, number of miles of critical main drains cleaned annually, number of manholes in the roadway repaired or raised annually, number of storm drain catch basins inspected annually, and the number cleaned annually, square feet of storm drain channels cleaned annually, number of storm channels inspected annually, square feet of storm channels sprayed for invasive plants, bushes, and trees annually. So that's really a comprehensive annual look at the sewer and storm drain maintenance. Next slide. And then still under infrastructure, um, just general maintenance, citywide maintenance, the square feet of graffiti removed from storm drain channels annually, square foot of graffiti move, removed from areas other than storm drains, Number of preventative work orders completed by central garage operation annually. And those are the folks that maintain all the city vehicles. Um, linear feet of CMP replaced annually. That's corrugated metal, metal pipe. That's trying to be, we're trying to replace that. Number of trees planted annually, number pruned annually, and number removed annually. So that's general maintenance. And then under water, we wanted to look at the annual gallons of water used per day per capita and the annual gallons of reclaimed water used per day per capita. So hopefully we're seeing the reclaim go up and the um, potable water use going down. So so, Kimberly, this is Commissioner Torres. So, um, the general maintenance, the road condition, and the sewer, um, could we not get that broken down between East and West Chula Vista? Because I know that uh, city staff has this all on a GIS uh, database. So, it shouldn't be that difficult for them to bifurcate that between East and West. I will ask them. Okay, and 
that's the last of the topics. If you like, we can, it's uh, 724. Um, we can go back to the beginning and talk about the um, comments you gave us last time and what we've changed or added based on your comments. We're talking about the memo? The memo, right, and how we edited the, the metrics based on your comments. Sounds good to me. Let's go back to, so we've been through public safety, 9, 10, 11, um, police. Slide 12, I will just tell you that, as I said before, we are still trying to get with the chief and staff and we will have something for you next. Um, that's slide 12, next meeting. On slide 13, next slide, Connie. You asked us um, the annual, ask us why this was important, the annual dollar value of donations received, and we considered that and agreed that it probably wasn't that important, so we eliminated it. I, can I make a comment on that? Sure. Okay. First of all, I mean, it's, it's about animals, so here's the thing. Um, mm -hmm. Did we... Before we eliminate this, I would like to make a point on this. Did we consult with the animal care facility on why they do this? Because maybe there's something behind this that we don't know. My understanding is that they rely a lot on donations compared to other right. city services, and that's why it's a metric for them. But um, Right, and, I'll, and I'm going to say this, and, and I'm just speaking from my own, because I go to a lot of fundraisers with the type of work that I do. Um, and part of the reason why they do this, okay, it's, it's optics, because a lot of people don't know they can donate, mm. and when it's publicized, it gets people to donate. Sure. So I would, honestly, I would say just leave it. Okay. I mean, I a reason to take it out to be honest with you i mean it's because it's not hurting anything to be there and and i'm pretty sure that if we were to talk to the people back then when they implemented that or put it in that they would probably tell you something along with what i just mentioned okay. well, let me, let me to explain to commissioner Candillo the reason why we took it out and the other commissioners can talk about it is that uh if on the, for animal care that we would need to do that for library we would need to do that for parks and recreation we would need to do that for other city departments because uh donations to animal care is not unique so if it's going to be one then it has to be for the others and then it brought into the question then is that in and of itself the value of donations is that you know uh, a valuable metric and, and i get, and i get where you're coming from with regard to uh, publicity, I mean, but that's something animal con control can, you know, does on its own. I mean, but is it something that we need to, um, uh, analyze as, as a metric? So that, that was the thinking last meeting, if any of the other commissioners want to opine, but that was what people were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, very well said. I mean. It, it, like I said, just, I was just making a point on why I know they probably had it in there, whether or not you guys want to choose to strike it out. That's up to you guys. It's up to you all. We, um, when we met with the head of the animal care facility, they said that's something they track and. And they, they track were, their own internal uh, reasoning or. Because I mean, they do it, rely quite a bit on donations and, you know, obviously the. Police fire infrastructure, I mean, you know, public works doesn't, um, but some. Other departments do, I, I have no idea how much parks and rec I'm soon the library gets donations as well. 
Yeah. So what is the other commissioner's thing? Strong and then yelled and aleatory. I, I can go either way, but that was the thinking. Right. Is Commissioner Lengel, I my preference would be to strike it because I agree we have to ask it for park and rec and library, and I think we're already asking for a lot of data, and I'm just worried about a little bit too much data and it's hard to dive deep in each each relevant piece. Okay. And this Commissioner Strong, I agree. I, I don't know how substantive it is to uh, to keep it in there to help us make decisions. To, I mean, because we get an overview on budget stuff, so I'm not sure. We can always ask during that, that presentation as well. Okay. So I'm hearing, take it out. Commissioner Padilla, is that okay with you? Well, I mean, I think we should leave it in there. I mean, it's already there. Um, they've already told you that they use it for their own internal. I mean, it might be something they use and maybe we don't, but I mean, I, I, I just say we leave it, but if the majority wants to take it out, then that's what, that's what we do. And this is going to be strong. To be honest, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a strong opinion either, either way. Um, I just don't feel like it's, it's that a substantive of a measure. We can always ask about it during budget, but um, like I said, I'm, I'm fine keeping it in there or taking it out, whatever y'all decide to do, whatever we decide to do. All right, this is Commissioner Torres. I'm not gonna bang on my sword over this, so let's just keep it in, and then let's just let's just move on. Okay. See, Commissioner Tadia, you gotta make sure your audio works next time, man, in the in these meetings, okay? So you can be participating. Man, I was on vacation. All right. If if I could just chime in a moment, um, I'm thinking perhaps this is included because. A lot of the donations that the animal care facility receives is not um, in monet is not monetary. It's in um, supplies, um, you know, blankets, towels, food, um, medicine, those types of things. So maybe that's why. And whereas some of the other departments, it's 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 actual dollars. Gotcha. Yeah, God knows I've given them a lot of cat food. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to housing. Next slide. So, Commissioner Torres, last time you corrected my notation about inclusionary housing and the actual name of the policy is balanced communities policy. And I believe there is more discussion of this coming in the housing element that you all are going to review at the planning commission. Right, right. No, I, I thought I thought this one was pretty powerful. I thought it was really well done. I went back and looked at the uh, that we all count report that's generated annually by the regional task regional task force on the homelessness, and <clears throat> their population inventory is broken down by sheltered and unsheltered, which I thought was important, and they do it by city and then the kind of the demographics that they break it down into by city is the number of chronically homeless veteran female and males families and youth um, I think there was a question about <clears throat> whether they broke down by race but, and they do countywide but they don't by city um, you also ask, is there crime data for the homeless? And the annual report on homelessness does not include crime, crime data for homeless people. And let's see, I think that's it. Um, okay. Any other questions? Next slide. Transportation. We updated some of these metrics after we had more um, discussion with the traffic operations staff. And instead of 
calculating the number of accessible pedestrian ramps and auto pedestrian signals. They thought it was a better metric to count the number number of controlled pedestrian crossings with countdown timers as a percentage of the total. So for them, adding countdown timers is a much better measurement of safety than the, the two I had above, which is actually not, those aren't technically ADA standards or requirements. <clears throat> and then we added um, the number of traffic collisions. Then under traffic efficiency, you wanted more definition on what they would be measuring under their annual level of service analysis. And they added this criteria. So they'll report the LOS measurements and they will be representative of typical traffic patterns during weekday peak hours, excluding variations from seasonal or atypical circumstances. So I'm assuming they exclude Christmas or if there's some big event or something. And secondly, that the arterial LOS calculations will be based on methodologies defined in the latest edition of the Highway Capacity Manual. And then in the memo I sent you, uh, they gave me a list of all the roadways that they plan to an analyze annually. So it's all the major roadways and very specific about from what place they start to the end and uh, on the east, divided by the east and west side. Let's see. You asked about the number of, can they evaluate the number of fatalities at city, city intersections as well as the overall count? Um, we just included the number of traffic collisions and the operations staff would um really rather have the safety commission evaluate those um metrics there's a lot of you know factors and and that's just what they would prefer which made sense to us you mean so address so uh, them evaluated for the lack of a better term offline no, at the house at the safety commission. Yeah, that's it's what I mean, but not not part of this. Well, I think the problem is that with something like that, that's uh, it. It's it may be taken out of context if you're just giving a number, and the way it was posed to us was at the city intersections, and there's just so many factors that go into. Um, you know, pedestrian fatalities. They prefer to keep that evaluation that's still public information at the safety commission. Okay. Okay. Next slide. So I don't think we had any changes on this one. Next slide. We had a discussion about eliminating the people of color <clears throat> metric and just leaving it at percentage of parks within a 10 minute walk for low income. And then at the last bullet I just corrected, I think was just to clarify, uh, within a 10 minute walk of a park that has disabled access. You all also had a recommendation to look at the quality of parks per zip code, and I'd love to have a bigger discussion on that. We really couldn't figure out how to, you know, value, you know, the people value different things about parks. So somebody might like a splash pad, somebody wants a soccer field. So we weren't sure how we would evaluate the proximity that people had to quality parks, but very much open to your thoughts on that. Well, this is the commission strong. 
there's, there's quality. I think when I was thinking about quality of parks, I thought I think about the um kind of the state of the park as far as the um um I don't want to say health, but maintenance, you know, maintenance, maintenance, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I always think about that the facility that we saw that had holes in the roofs, right? Yeah, and yeah. So, what percent of the population is by a park that's in good, um, you know, good standing? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I, I don't I'll... know if other commissioners had thoughts on that. That's no, it sounds good to me. We'll check back with Parks and Rec and see if they can help us with thoughts on that. Okay, next slide. Libraries, uh, you asked us to add these metrics. We checked with the head librarian and she agreed that that's something they could track, which is the hours of internet used annually, the number of internet hotspots provided, and the library use by age group. Okay, next slide. Arts and culture. Um, you made a comment that some of these seem redundant, so I combined these two. Number of city sponsored classes, art, art related classes, and the number of participants. Next slide. One more, Connie. Go to edu okay, education. Um, you all had some great thoughts about measuring uh, the number of students who drop out of high school annually, and we found a, a dashboard a statewide for all public schools that's uh, independent of anything that the local schools generate. And so we can get that information. What we have not been able to find is the percentage of students failing by grade level, which I think is a, something that'd be very interesting to look at. Um, and so we'll keep digging on that. The school district hasn't been real responsive. Um, the, were you uh, utilizing AdSource? Was that your, the? Uh... Oh. It might be. Yeah, because because um, yeah, because that's a, a great data source. Uh, it, it was a compilation of the all the statewide data by yeah. school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, I, I I used to have access to all that database. So if if you come to a <clears throat> if you hit a wall, just let me know, and I can point you some other data sources. Okay. That'd be great. Um, education. Community engagement, you asked us to add the number of city sponsored workshops, outreach programs, and we can do that. Um, the redistricting commission presentation we heard tonight is an example. You, we had a discussion about data that might be available from the San Diego Workforce Partnership about disconnected youth and Commissioner Strong, I think this was your comment. And I looked on their website, they have some really interesting articles. Um, but we would, I, I think what I need to do is contact them personally and see if they do any regular measurement of their programs or outreach to disconnected youth and if they have any statistics on that. If anybody has a contact there that you think would be good, be happy to take that. Sounds good, Kim. This is Commissioner Strong. I could I could um, put you in contact with somebody from work. Oh, that'd be great. Yep. <clears throat> so I think they're they're really valuable. They do great work, obviously, and they have valuable information. And next slide. Yep, yeah. so that concludes. Now we've gone through all the topics. What I'd like to do is come back next month with the second half. We'll go back and research 
what you asked us to do tonight. And I think then we'll be, then we'll come back and have a comprehensive list and we can um, continue to look at it, refine it, and then go from there. I can't. That, I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. Kim, I got one question. Can you go back to education just real quick? Sure. There you okay. go. I mean, we're, you know, we're asking for a lot of data. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out what we're going to do with all this. But I, I think when we talk about education, you know, so I mean, this is just my thoughts. This is how I see things. But, you know, we're asking about graduation rates, who's all going to college. Yeah, but there's but there's a lot of precursors to why kids end up graduating or why they don't. I mean, so one of the things I'm wondering about, and I'm not saying we need to put this in there, but I mean, we're just, we're asking for a lot of data here, but you know, what about like after school programs and so forth like that? Because I mean, that, that has a direct connection to people, you know, children end up graduating. So, I mean, is that something that, you know, you think that's just too much data or because to me, that's important information to know, but for our community, I'm wondering um, if it's pertinent or not because it kind of ties into everything we're asking here, or are we just looking for the end result? I, I'll, I'll, I'll interject if I can, because I used to be the senior policy analyst for the San Diego Unified School Board. So yeah, you, you're basically, you're, you're right, Commissioner Cadillo, in that there is a cause effect relationship that needs to be analyzed, but we're looking at the end stats, if you will, because uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, let, let me put it this way. If staff is having problems getting cooperation from uh, uh, Sweetwater Unified and Chula Vista Elementary with regard to percentage of students failing by grade level, uh, right. I don't know if they're going to get that much more cooperation about those part participating in after school programs. Because right. those after school programs are remedial. You're right. They are remedial. So, um, if uh, you know, you could gauge, you know, something in that the number of those participating, and uh, and that it implies students who are struggling. But then again, uh, many of those after school programs are not just about students who are who are struggling, but also for students who like AP courses, and so on. You know, there's a whole lot of right different types of after school programs. Right, exactly. That's right. So. I, my whole thing is that um, because now we're going into quality of life, you know, the, the previous metrics that we had from Sweetwater and Chula Vista really were kind of, you know, mundane and didn't, you know, uh, connote anything. They were growth anything. related. Yeah, they, they were growth related. They didn't connote anything. But um, I think these ones are, are, are more meaningful to uh, assess quality of life. And, and I think, you know, whatever staff can get readily available from, uh, you know, available resources, and they may have to go outside, like Kimberly was talking about, to EdSource or CDE. CDE, uh, the, uh, the California Department of Ed, has a, a tremendous uh, uh, database uh, that's downloadable that will tell you virtually almost anything. And, uh, but that would be my counsel is, is that, I mean, how far do you really want to go? You know what I mean? Right. That's, that's kind of what I was kind of getting at. Cause we're trying to capture a lot of data and maybe it's yeah. just not, that, so we're not really in the preventative mode here. We're just trying right. to capture the end result. Of exactly. But, and I, and I think those are good indicators, you know, end result yeah. indicators. Okay. So uh, that concludes staff's presentation. So Chairman Cadillo, you may want to ask for a two minute um, time for the public to comment. Yes, I will now call for a two minute pause to allow the public to submit any comments on the item. Commissioners, as a reminder, please refresh the view on your screen to ensure new comments appear.
The timer has started. Okay, the timer is out and uh, there are no comments that have come in. Okay, do any of our commissioners have any comments or questions? Yeah, this is Commissioner Torres. Is that um, one is this issue about the Police Advisory Commission? Is that um, you know, in my former life, I used to be staff to city and county task forces and commissions. So I don't want to put our staff in an untenable situation. Okay. But it's, it's kind of, you know, when this came up the last meeting is that uh, it was abundantly clear uh, on the type and quality of metrics that we got based on the interface of staff with other commissions and then what we got for police and the fact that the P police advisory commission wasn't engaged so um this is what uh, i would suggest is that um we're going to have another meeting on august 15th i believe yeah the fifth august the fifth okay august the fifth and you're going to seek direction from Tiffany because I actually brought this up at our planning commission meeting yesterday about um, the fact that uh, the police advisory commission had not been engaged with regard to the police department metrics. So I brought it up yesterday. So this won't be news to her. Um, I would just leave it to you guys to talk to Tiffany and then when we come back on august the 5th hope presumably we're going to have new metrics that that hopefully will address the uh, white house uh, open data initiative dashboard so um i would like the police chief to be part of that meeting and and if the police chief wants to tell us uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. You know, I and I don't want to speculate. Is there some kind of dynamic going on between the police chief and the advisory commission? And we don't want to get caught up in that. But you know, I I'd, I'd like to find out. You know, from at least from the the horse's mouth, so to speak, what's going on. Commissioner Torres, I made it very clear at the last meeting that the lack of detail on the police stats was completely our fault. We did not look at the dashboard and we should have. Kim and I have since met with, it has nothing to do with going to the commission or not going to the commission. And it's unfortunate that you're tying the two together. 
because it sounds like this is something that could really blow blow up and doesn't need to be. Kim and I have met with staff. We have a great list of metrics that I th I think you will find they are absolutely consistent with their dashboard. The chief, the 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 guy that does the metrics and the chief have been out at different times, so we were unable to meet with both of them together. And the chief wanted us, she wanted to be there when we made the final list. So my plan is to go back to her and I will talk to Tiffany, um, but we will have a different list for you. It has nothing to do with the police commission. I haven't even asked the chief about going to the police commission. You did not ask the chief. I did not. Okay, then then let's press the point is that um, why engage all the other advisory commissions and not this one? And I will get management's direction on that, as I said. Okay, all right, I'll leave it at that. Then. And if I could just add um, the memo that was in your packet last meeting, that um, went into detail about the history of the GMOC and where we're how we're moving forward was recently provided to the chief because I think she wants wanted a little more um, um, information on on where we're going because we haven't been able to connect personally. So now she at least has that, and then the next step will be as Kim said to touch base with her. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kim. She wanted more context. Yeah. Okay, no problem. I'm just I just want to make sure that there's nothing that, that's preventing staff from engaging the advisory commission because of whatever. I just want to make sure for staff's benefit. But you know, again, you know, talk to your talk to Tiffany and get your direction and, and I'll look forward to the next iteration. So are we good? Yes, we will do that. Okay, so are we moving on now, Kim? Yes, um, uh, that concludes to, staff uh, presentation. I'm sorry? That concludes staff's presentation for that item. Oh, okay. All right, so then we're moving on down to the bottom to other business, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. So this time we're going to move into other business. Uh, our wonderful staff. We you have any comments? I have no comments. No comment. I think we just want to remind you that the next meeting is August 5th. That will still be virtual. Um, and we're, you know, we're working towards getting back to meeting in public. Um, so some of the commissions are starting, but. It's, you know, they're rolling them out. And then just a reminder that the August 15th, I believe that, or 19th, I believe that's the date, Kim, um, yeah. is the boards and commissions um, annual appreciation event. Appreciation event, yes. So yeah. we hope you would all attend that. And it's the 19th. 19th. So that's the night that we would normally have a commission meeting. So we will not have a meeting that night. Okay. That's right. at the new library deck at the Chula Vista Library. Oh, great. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, does that conclude staff comments? Yes, it does. So. It does. Okay. So a uh, chair's comments. So that would be me tonight. So I just want to, you know, just say something okay guys we you know this commission we're taking a big in my opinion a big undertaking here okay we're asking a lot from each other we're asking a lot from staff so we all need to be patient um and let's keep doing what we're doing but look look at all this i mean i'm going through here looking at all these metrics and stuff i mean we're we're revamping all the categories and all the metrics that you know we we're deeming to be irrelevant. So let's just keep keep moving forward. You know, staffs doing the best that they can. 
Um, and my only question now is what, where are we at from here on camp? Do we need to schedule more meetings based on where we are right now on the feedback you're getting from the commissioners um, and so forth? Commissioner Cadillo, I think that would be um, something we can discuss at the next meeting. I think I'll get more information about what our next steps will be. Okay. All right. Yeah, and, and the the reason why I'm asking is the sooner we can identify, you know, how many. I mean, I don't really want to honestly put me personally. I don't really want to put. Well, we need to get this done in three or four meetings because we we don't know where we're going to be in three or four meetings. I, I really don't like to do things like that. But it would be kind of nice to know if we need to set up more meetings so we can schedule them out. For sure, I I hear you and. Um... How about if we we come forward with a, a plan to to carry on and get this over the finish line at the next meeting? You know, we normally meet the first and third Thursdays, so those would be dates to just set aside on your calendar for now. Okay. Now, do have we set a date, a tentative date on when we were thinking about having this completed? Not we that that's have, going to be the date, but do we have a tentative date? We do not. We don't. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. That can be I... my comment. And do we have any other commissioner comments? Seeing no commissioner comments, I guess. That concludes the meeting, correct? I believe so. Okay. Thank, you, thank you for filling in at the last minute, Vice Chair Cadillo. No problem. No problem. It's my honor. So I will say on adjournment, it is, let's see, what time is it? 8 so 1 p.m. I am adjourning this meeting to the next regular meeting of the Growth Management Oversight Commission on tentatively August 5th, 2021 at 6 p.m. via teleconference. Conference room 103, building A276 4th Avenue, Chula Vista, California. Thank good you. Night, everybody. Good, night. Thanks, good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.